Hello. <laughs> so welcome everybody for joining this Women Being Talks number two, Indigenous Respect. We are so excited <laughs> to be launching this new storytelling initiative um, with founder of Women Magazine and myself, we decided that we needed to hear other voices, other perspectives on what's currently happening around the world and also bring light to peer-to-peer -peer conversations of women that are very talented all around the world that have so much to say about what's happening and what are the views that are not being shared on mainstream media and what are the other perspectives that need to um, help us, that can help us uh, thrive through this whole situation. And without further ado, I wanna leave this whole conversation to the dear <laughs> colleagues and friends of mine. I want to bring over um, Hannah Ruth Dyson, founder of Soul Seed Gathering and also Catherine De Rose, De Rose De Leon. She's Weaver of Light. Um, they're both based in different countries. Um, Hannah is currently based in Costa Rica and um, Catherine is based in California. So welcome both. I'm gonna leave the conversation to you both. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Natalia. I um, yeah, I'm so happy to be here and be part of this conversation when Natalia reached out about joining this conversation series. I wasn't quite sure who I'd reach out to. And then I had a conversation with Catherine. And as soon as we started speaking, I was like, wow, people need to hear this. <laughs> and this is the kind of conversation I would love to, um, yeah, broadcast to the world and have shared. And I think the thing that um, I've been <laughs> taking a lot of different sources of media, a lot of different viewpoints, there's so much um, taking place all at once. And what I found uh, lacking, uh, and which is something that Catherine brought so much to our conversation, was this respect of elders because Catherine herself lives with her grandmother and um, has been very much connected to elders in her community and with my work I work with indigenous research and with different um, indigenous groups I've been fortunate to work with these incredible indigenous female elders and they in a huge part of indigenous groups are this um, centering of elders and this honoring of them as the wisdom keepers and how important that is. Um, what I discovered, I feel like my speaker just dropped. Uh, what I discovered was that, uh, <laughs> What I discovered is that my um, that through a lot of the conversations happening in media and through a lot of my peers as well that seem to be so focused on maybe their own rights being taken away, being kept inside, feeling a lot of things going on at, um, at the same time, and, um, at, and in many ways sometimes like ignoring the elders in their community and maybe being like, oh well, this uh, virus only really seems to affect elders, it only seems to kill older people who are already um, sick, so it's not necessarily um, yeah, that much impact on us, why should we do this? And I was hearing some of these conversations, and I'd love just to hear from you, Catherine, um, some of the things that you were sharing with me before about what this opportunity is really giving us, this pandemic, to really look at ourselves and our relationship with elders in our community. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's, I feel the timeline within my own self and my experience with the pandemic has both been like a very slow pace, but also a very rapid space, a pace. And within those two realms are um, the slow pace of of, of, of seeing what, the way um, it's unfolding for, um, um, for elders within my community or how I would, um, how I had to look at it from different viewpoints of how I would experience it as a person in my generation if I was living alone. 
um, versus how uh, my, now that I have an infusion of caring for my grandmother, how is she now experiencing this? Um, versus how are people experiencing it in Mexico? How are people experiencing it in the Amazon? And um, um, for me, uh, the biggest um, reflections were just, there was this opportunity of how, how, at what, um, how, how much will, are we willing to sacrifice in order to protect our elders, right? Let's say that this pandemic hit our elders, this, this specifically hit our elders. At what, are we willing to stay at home? Are we willing to, um, to wash our hands? Are we willing to do these things, even though it might not affect us personally as much as it would so um, of people that are elder or disabled? Um, it was really, an opportunity to to see what we were willing to to um, to put forth. Sorry, pardon me for the moment. Um, yeah, I. Pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> no, I totally um, relate with what you're saying because I mean I'm sure the reaction response is completely different country to country and. I have really just the experience of living in this small Caribbean town right now in Costa Rica. And I would say there's like a predominantly high um, interest um, with expats in conspiracy theories and mm -hmm. what is really going on here and, and all those things. And I think there could be some real things to pay attention to, like uh, certain freedom of speech being violated and uh, rights, especially for women being taken away at this time, like rights to abortion, rights to many different things, like rights to different alternative health care. So there's definitely things to be concerned about um, at any generation and, and in, in sort of what is taking place at this time. But what I sense also in this community was like, we're not going to, we're not going to stay locked down. We're just going to keep doing what we want. We're going to, um, we don't, I don't know if we believe in this. <laughs> and so on and I um, right before I spoke to you I had just been um, connecting with a lot of indigenous tribes who are talking about the remembrance especially in the Americas of when colonizers first arrived and brought mm -hmm. diseases that killed 90% mm -hmm. like of their people um, mm -hmm. it's believed and this is still so um, fresh and what you said about like what are we willing to do like some Amazon tribes are going so deep into the jungle, like they've never gone so deep before, giving up actually land where they've actually cultivated and grown food. And like, you know, they're not all based on hunter gathering that they've also developed their own agricultural systems and so forth. Um, but now having to abandon those just to try and escape the, um, the virus that is coming through miners coming illegally and Mm -hmm. uh, missionaries still trying to enter into these spaces mm -hmm. and so it was very um, very uh, present with me like okay this is something to really like think about and respect and take some time to integrate and here for example we have the Bri Bri people and I I have spoke to some of them and they have kind of a different process as well of relating to the disease and, and, and what is taking place. They do a lot of fasting and spiritual work to uh, disconnect also from, from media, but they are also protecting themselves and staying uh, on the whole isolated. And um, it was this thing that I noticed also with the sort of expert community of uh, exactly what you're saying, what are we willing to do? And it's nearly like this childish response like no i don't want to stay locked down i don't want to uh, for example here we're not allowed to go to the beach so that's a huge thing for people and you could argue like uh, if i go to the beach by myself am i really you know creating a problem but it's still um this interesting conversation i think about um and you can hear the the fruit sellers driving past my street right now on microphone but um yeah, I, I was really touched by the way your relationship with your grandmother and then also your, um, your grandmother's sister 
Um, and this, um, I think, direct connection, which many of us are lacking in our society. Unfortunately, all my grandparents um, have passed um, several years ago, but uh, that shouldn't be a disconnect from other elders and other um, ways of seeing and relating to this, um, yeah, this time and what are we all um, willing to do and um, how are we willing to respond? Um, how, how has your grandmother Catherine felt around, um, I guess, the different um, pieces, like some people um, also in the United States protesting now against uh, lockdown and wanting to be kind of let out and um, what do you see through, through her eyes and, and through them? Um, she, as this was unfolding, there was such a deep level of fear. There was such a deep level of fear of what, what is this? And um, she was surrounded by so much media at the time and I slowly tried to help balance that out in her system, but um, it, in, it invaded, it intruded just as um, the, the loggers and such invade our communities in the forest. There's different types of invaders that are happening in the modern elder society and not just elder society, but our society, right? The invaders are coming in different ways through media. Um, and through um, just other channels that aren't as obvious maybe. Um, and so those were kind of things to pay close attention to how much she was, um, how much that was of that she was soaking in and how that was affecting her daily. And um, uh, she was in a space of like really deep, like stuckness until I, we kind of ex expressed um, the opportunity of, of creating masks for um, the indigenous community out in um, Mexico via the Orienda tribe. And um, she felt this, this light, she's, she's, uh, she was a seamstress before. And so she felt this like spark of light within her of like, I can do something in this time. You know, um, she, there was an ignition of, of, um, of a shift of focus of, of, being victim to what was happening um, externally to being a part of the solution. And I think that that's what a lot of COVID is kind of uh, firing up in us is this initiation of like, what can we do to help unify each other through our, our small actions, making 25 masks, um, sending food to local hospitals, um, just learning your neighbor's names. You know, um, COVID has really connected us in, in, in a deeper way. And um, um, re in regards to my grandmother, it, she, I just have such deep um, compassion for her because imagine what we're going through and how we're feeling and how we're navigating through this. And imagine her going through that in her age. And in addition, she um, just had a sister that was placed in a nursing home and she ended up passing from COVID. And so to, to see, um, and the storyline of kind of how that um, came about was really this kind of lack of, of care for the elderly, um, where she, she was placed into a home really essentially against her own personal will. And similar to COVID, now we're placed in our homes, in a sense, against our will. How does this feel to us? How does it feel in our body to be in the, like to, to be in a, a prisoner in a way, right? And so um, the, I feel this uh, experience is really showing us a lot of different perspectives of like, how, how are we treating our elders? Um, um, I, I wrote this, um, this poem, if breath, I think I've, I've shared this with you before, but if breath is to life as force are to lungs, then we must protect our forest and we must protect our lungs. For without them, there is no breath. And for without them, there is no life. And I think that the trees represent our elders. They rep represent our lungs. And so if we're not caring for our lungs, if we're not caring for our elders, then th this, this beautiful world that we live in cannot continue on, cannot regenerate, cannot create oxygen for us to breathe. Um, and it's ironic that toilet paper was 
the number one thing that people were um, buying during this time of pandemic. And, uh, you know, those are from trees. And that is something that we use to wipe our, our, ourselves with to throw away. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what is that language now being communicated, right? Here we are, our elders or the trees, how can we respect them more? How can we know where the, the toilet paper is being produced? These are now like small things that um, have come to surface through this time is, is what are things that we can embody in this time to help protect our elders, whether it's caring for them on an emotional level or being conscious of what we're purchasing within our own homes and understanding how that affects life on the other side of the world. Um, a lot of what's arisen is, is what are, what is happening in our homes? What is, what, what is happening in our homes? Are we rooted in the values of, of indigenous wisdom? And the indigenous wisdom doesn't just come, um, the indigenous wisdom comes in the whispering of the trees or just the, the observing of the way my grandmother lives and, and the, the pr deep presence that she has when, when she's sewing, when she's washing the vegetables, when she's washing her hands, you know, that's where, that's where the, the wisdom is. And so how can we reflect that and now integrate that wisdom into our home space? Um, and yeah, <laughs> uh, I love the, the imagery you use and I feel yeah, I feel like it's what, um, I feel like I, I feel so fortunate to have been part of the work that I've done for the last uh, seven or so years because uh, it is retracing our steps back to our own indigenous connection, our own ancestral roots because we all belong to lands and many of us at this time belong to many lands um, ancestrally mm -hmm. and um, have moved around a lot um, but it's this coming back to a rootedness to a sense of place upon the earth this is what I've um, learned through yeah also my own lineages but also then indigenous um, elders I've been able to sit with it's like uh, when you really respect yourself as a child of the earth and you respect yeah. this wisdom that is a greater power than us and we have to recognize how far society has come away from that because mm. I, I pick on it now because I'm so sensitive in all media and in, in a lot of the language that's used this idea that technology will save us this idea that science will save us this idea um, and I don't take away anything from those tech these incredible bodies of technology and um, learning but if we don't respect the ultimate intelligence which is of nature when you begin to study nature and the way its processes and cycle it's like such a perfect system that we are ultimately we can't escape from we are part of we are never how and the, i think truly the greatest sickness that we've developed as a society is believing we can override control dominate mm -hmm. extract and then just dump our waste continuously and basically ignore and this create like shields like I don't need to to think about it or look at it and we've stayed so distracted and many of us have felt for a long time oh yeah we do need to take changes in our everyday life we do need to think about the environment more um, but I think it's this key piece that I still see missing and um, many movements or many conversations politically media um, is centering indigenous people in fact what i often hear is the narrative is that indigenous people are dying off and they will soon be extinct and what i have felt for the last few years is quite the opposite because as a modern society i feel we are so dependent we're so fragile we're so um uh, used to all of these conveniences and um, are we are we able to go out into the forest and find food just by mm -hmm. our own knowledge and our own sense mm -hmm. of survival and the, the beautiful thing is I don't think it takes that long to get back to that but it does take um, 
a shift in consciousness and mindset mm -hmm. and um like you say like when you respect the trees as elders and you respect also um our own elders in society and what i love so much about your work catherine and your um way of expressing through art and your activism and so forth is that it's always rooted in what is here and now and who are my connections and how can i support my community and so forth where i have you know also worked in this sort of global space and worked with more like far out indigenous tribes and so on and also coming back to myself and my family and my immediate network and how important that is like um i shared with you before like i was really grateful especially in two of my grandparents right before they passed that last mm -hmm. year or six months i was able to connect to their wisdom like never before like mm -hmm. it, sometimes we can also miss it because we're so uh <laughs> like for example my grandfather who wasn't always an easy person and he wasn't um there was a lot of family issues around um you know unresolved conflicts and so forth but when i could connect to him and especially in that passage towards death it was like this beautiful um wisdom that would come through and and an essence like this nearly like returning to his childhood and just seeing this beautiful connection and equally with my grandmother right before she passed i felt i could connect with her um with pieces of my own story and pieces of understanding who I am also um, through them that I see um, we can easily miss in our modern society because one, we don't have a good relationship with death. We like to push it away. I grew up in the UK in Wales and, and from like a very British family and um, half of my family. And there's this nearly like, you don't want to look at it. You don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and the funerals are pretty depressing. It's all dark. Whereas learning about then also other cultures where it's like a celebration and you talk about the place of life and you honor and you, you accept death as part of life. That's such a huge thing in Mexico, for example, with the day of the dead and mm -hmm. just like this, this full party and like celebration of death death which is ultimately then celebration of life and um and then also with our society i feel um, as a modern society we've so focused on young able-bodied uh adults as being the ultimate we kind of dismiss and ignore the children you go away to play school and like preschool or whatever and just like go and sit in the corner and then elders, yeah, we're going to put you in a in a account because we don't have time. We're busy. We have so much going on. And mm -hmm. um, then sitting with our elders can be a real um, just slowing down process, <laughs> like a slower pace, which is also the earth but slowing mm -hmm. down. And like you shared, this pandemic has kind of forced us into that slowing mm -hmm. down. And perhaps being able to look at our life in a different way I think a lot of people are realizing their values through this time like oh wow I'm actually connecting I mean for myself as well like I'm connecting more with certain family members and like making time to do zoom calls and doing all those things it's like why were we so busy before like I, I don't think we were that busy I don't know we could always find time if we really centered it as a value so mm -hmm. Huge gifts, and um, I do think we have this huge opportunity moving on. If you could vision like where we could move on to from here, what would you sort of be your call to people and, and your wish for people to kind of really do to stand up at this time and, and move forward with? Is just to be daring, to be daring in our. Um, in, in what we're dreaming, um, to, to recognize all of the space that's being created for us to absolutely build what we feel in our hearts is needed to move forward. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I pray that, that we, as we create, we're rooted in a space of, um, of, of sensitivity and gentleness as well, as far as um, I think it's, 
in this time, we can create anything, anything that we want, but to be really conscious of every single, um, every single aspect that we're integrating into what we are creating. And what that is, yeah. That's been like, it's so interesting how just this slowing down, real, like this kind of, like you mentioned with your grandma, being able to channel something into creation, into action. Mm. I was quite surprised in my, in my work or in my, um, my own life, just what was coming through me, like what I really wanted to speak to and connect to. And mm. I, um, I studied business economics and uh, at the time, I was in London, I was at the London School of Economics, which is like a really prestigious school. And I was like that pretty much the whole time I, when I was there, kind of like, what am I doing here? This isn't really my path. I don't want to become a banker mm -hmm. or a, uh, like whatever. The, all my sort of peers were entering into those sort of, um, paths. But um, I started to study during the Occupy movement and the 2008 crash. And mm -hmm. so it was really interesting time. Like <laughs> we were like, studying economics in the context of just the, the crash that has happened. And I felt so connected to the Occupy movement. And I also then felt um, kind of empowered because I was actually beginning to understand the economic system. Whereas before, I kind of just assumed this is just the way it is. We're just operating within the society. We just, this is just, this is it. And when I I felt the superpower that came through studying it. it was like, this is just an experiment mm -hmm. and this can change. This mm -hmm. system has to change because mm -hmm. how it's not been, um, and us all being part of it. Um, it's, it's so, um, it's, it's not really been benefiting. I believe anyone, even the people mm -hmm. we perceive to be benefiting the 1% or so on, but, I don't think it's really benefiting anyone if we can't survive here on earth and we are, mm -hmm. you know, distracting quicker than we are um, replenishing. Um, mm -hmm. It's this, um, I think this, this knowledge of the system and, and, and studying systems ever since and, and exploring it and then obviously working with indigenous groups for the last seven years, it's been like, how can we bring these knowledge and these different you know seemingly very disparate like ways of thinking and seeing mm -hmm. the world how can we start to actually bring it together and i loved what mm -hmm. you said uh to actually bring courage at this time to feel the spark of like um yeah we can actually make change and i believe um the only adequate response to this pandemic and to uh, many of our systems collapsing and failing and leadership really looking very fragile and weak pretty much all over the world is to take our power back and our sense of power back and the ability mm -hmm. to actually change things. Mm -hmm. And I also do think this comes back to our individual choices. I think to recognize that our choices actually do matter. And I am, I am the same when I think like, you know, an extra plastic bag gets handed to me or straw most of the time I'll say no and then occasionally I'm like oh it's just like you know another one and, and there's so much out you know like is it really making a dent um but it really is when we all operate in this way and a lot of work has been done for example around plastic but I do think we do need to get to a place where we mature as a society and nearly take responsibility where every purchase every choice has a ripple effect and we're taking account and we're taking accountability and this um, shift back to uh, predominantly local to support creators mm. and craftsmanship and and people um, directly and our local farmers getting to know our farmers to also grow our food and um, to be in the community um, is also claiming our power back from this mm. bigger system and it's, it's also, um, it's not going to be immediate. We're so used to everything yeah. being acceptable. And um, I don't necessarily believe like in a, like um, forced, I don't know, you know, shift or a utopian kind of uh, dream as being like 
um, so idealistic that I'm like ignoring like all the stuff that is part of our lives. But I do think um, we have so much power and just even these conversations, being able to um, acknowledge different ways of seeing, I think um, it was a huge profound moment for me when I traveled to Colombia and I met with the Kogi people who have, uh, you know, one, um, a very, a very different way of being in the world um, than us in general. And I, they see us as younger siblings, as they see themselves as older brothers and sisters to, to us. And this is a huge shift in consciousness and mindset um, within tourism and also within the nonprofit sector, which believes we can save indigenous people and we're here to help them. And we are here to help them become educated and to, like, achieve the technology, like technological advances and so on. Which is not to say they're not interested always in some mm. of our technologies or in some of our ways of being. There is this really amazing opportunity, I think, always for exchange, cultural mm -hmm. exchange between one another. Um, but this uh, kind of centering of modern society and us mm. as the mm. ones that have progressed, the ones that are developed, the ones that are um, really superior, which is imperialistic, mm. you know, hugely colonial, but it's like, embedded in our education system it's embedded in our media systems it's embedded mm -hmm. in our nonprofit sector it's embedded in the way we do tourism which is like we can go visit these people as like an attraction like maybe mm -hmm. like a zoo or like a performance and and it's us recalibrating that and shifting those mindsets and coming back to like wow it's also not this idea they don't they don't want us to romanticize them or put them on the pedestal i remember at the time this was a few years ago i was like not i was kind of wanting to hide behind my project as a white person i was very interested in doing this work like mm -hmm. just for myself but and i just it kept coming to me in many different ways but i didn't want to be the face of it i didn't want to be centered i didn't want to be even on it and then they, <laughs> and then they like, kind of sat me down and they were like you better be the face of it because we're not the face of it and we have things to share with you, but um, yeah, we don't necessarily also want our faces online or to be um, seen in this way. You've got to go and do your work. And can you go back to your people and ask them to change their dream? And I think that's something you, you touched on as well. Like how much can we dream of a different way and how can we really take ownership of our dreams? I love, um, Adrian Marie Brown, she talks about this war on the imagination. We've had a war on the imagination on what we believe to be mm. possible. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to just hear from you again, like what um, could you imagine? I know one of your projects previously has been like, um, like reimagining elder care and elder mm. hope. And I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so, one of the visions that we've birthed is um, reimagining elder care and then bringing it back to our homes and creating um, comfortable spaces for our elders to navigate, um, but also based on sustainable foundations. And so um, from looking at diapers, um, looking at wipes, looking at what, um, what creams they're putting on their bodies, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, that's something that I can't quite even touch or even enter right now, but I'm just looking at um, reimagining the home for, um, for seniors and, um, and, and seeing ways where we can integrate um, our generation and in, with theirs and infusing that. And um, that's, that's one project that I've been working on, but also Baha'i Dali Sai is another project that I've been working on, um, which Baha'i and Tagalog and Filipino um, language means home and dalisai means pure, purify. So it's the purifying of our home. And I feel um, it's based on some systems that we can integrate into our homes easily. And it's essentially all of the, the, the dreams and the ideas that I have brewing right now are based on the foundation of interde interdependence and that everything that we're infusing into our homes um, has to be sourced properly and understood where it's coming from. And so um, 
Baha'i Dali Sai will be a space in which uh, you can come to uh, when you're ready to kind of integrate into a new way of being and living. Um, and by, by integrating into this new way of living, you are respecting the earth and the people of the earth and the people that have come before us that have set the path for us to be exactly where we are. Um, and also respect our future generations. Um, I think it really is about building businesses that are um, based on like really deep rooted values um, mm -hmm. and, and reimagining all the different systems, not just the, like there's a big, a huge fashion revolution happening. There's a huge, you know, there's, there's a lot of realms that are being touched on, but um, it's, it's about reimagining every single realm in Nook and Cranny um, for us to get like a really bigger picture of how this world can can kind of evolve into. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. Do you have um how is how has been your like cultural experience from your like Filipino roots to being planted in the United States? How is your um do you feel like your lens has been shaped from like your ancestral roots um and being in the United States? How has that felt? You know, my journey back into my ancestral roots has started about two and a half years ago when I started caretaking for, for my grandparents. And, um, and it, I also, I always had to disconnect actually with my roots because I don't look the typical Filipino. And um, I was often labeled as um, other ethnicities. And so I never felt like I fit in um, a, certain, a certain group, nor did I feel comfortable stating Filipino, but Filipino is also of many different lineages of Chinese, of, of Spanish, and um, but the more uh, I root with my elders, the more um, I'm, I, I, I see the reflection of myself in, 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 in them and their ways of living and being, and um, um, I did spend some time out in the Philippines and reconnected um, with with some communities out there and in Lake Cebu and Mindanao and I spent time just out on the farmlands building huts with them. Um, we, you know, our our restrooms were they they just they showed me um, a life that the life that my my family came from you know, that I was totally disconnected from. And now that they're here, um, there's kind of a disconnection in, in that way of being. And so it's like, as I'm reconnecting with that way of being that they were rooted from, um, I'm also seeing the difference in um, the, the kind of integration that's happened um, from them moving here and now, all of us having to come back to that rootedness of like, how many buckets of water does it take to wash your body? You know, every day I would only use three bucketfuls of water and I was good. Versus here, you know, we, we could run the shower to warm it up and that's already X amount of buckets full. And so there's just this um, beautiful simplifying um, when I've returned to my roots that I am now able to um, integrate into my life and practice here. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love I love hearing about everyone's cultural roots and, and ancestry as well because I think it gives us so many clues. As I trace my own ancestral roots, they're all kind of Celtic, Anglo, Germanic, um, like some Slavic, like all across kind of those lands, and they all are pretty much um, just several generations back, very poor um kind of out of the land farmers and i think very strong resilient people but very like practical it's like a very um and i love this in sort of old, older celtic um spirituality and, and indigenous wisdom it's like this um it's never romanticized nature is very um and i mean that in a sense like it's never like sometimes we we think of nature as soft or as beautiful as this um, incredible thing, but it's really like with all the elements of um, rock and stone and um, 
and the earth and mm -hmm. uh, the fire and uh, the the storms that can come through and this kind of hardening of your your skin nearly in your your body to work with all weather and this um, sort of practicality of um, of working with the land and uh, it's so interesting how I, I arrived here in Costa Rica in the jungle in a land that's really so foreign to mm. my 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 being but then I also felt this immense sense of home as soon as mm. I arrived I felt this um, really strong feeling like this is where I'm meant to be and everything um, really came together in my own life for being here so it's it's also this um, learning of how to um, to kind of bring back my ancestral knowledge and roots and so on and then also um, experience the land here fully and the people here fully and uh, I think that's my biggest wish for all of us is to be rooted in some sense of where we come from and who we are and to pay attention to people like the original people of the land and also all the things that have gone on I love here in this um, in this area because no one feels they really belong like the the Bribri who are the, really the first people, they kind of have always lived more in the mountains and would come on pilgrimages down to the ocean. They would fish and they would maybe camp for a little while, but then they would always go back to the mountains. Um, and then this coastal area then got um, like many, um, you know, African slaves arrived from like either to help with the railway or from Jamaica. Um, they actually went crab fishing and then found this land and so decided to make it their land. And, it has such an abundance of cacao, making chocolate and so on. Um, so yeah, they and they were immediately welcomed. I mean, in the historical narrative, they was immediately welcomed by the indigenous as a community. And then bit by bit, expats from all over the world have arrived here. Like seventy six countries have uh, landed here, and it's not that big a population. Um, I and. It's just such an interesting melting pot of um, knowing quite belonging and then us all belonging in a way because we've chosen to, to be here and we can talk about, um, there isn't such this sense of um, like, this is my land, like, mm -hmm. you know, get out of here. It's very much like, and even you know, the Afro-Caribbean community, very welcoming every step of the way. I mean, um, it's meant, um, more contact, more ability to trade, more ability to then develop tourism, which has become a major focus. But I also have seen how quickly, um, since I arrived here five years ago, how quickly things have changed. Mm -hmm. um, and also this kind of kickback from, I think, a lot of people who think it going too quickly into um, developed sort of um, territory and um, just the road becoming improved just changed so much people start to drive so much faster mm. and they used to be and there was like everyone would always be so friendly and a huge hitchhiking community like not many people had cars so anyone else would get picked up and now it's kind of rarer to get picked up and, and it feels mm. a little bit more disconnected but through this pandemic um, I've seen this joy mm. <laughs> through local people people also just like oh we, we feel some peace here like this is our place also again we don't also feel foreign or weird um and i know yeah natalia wants us this, uh opening up to q and a so yeah um definitely open for any questions anyone has <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sorry i just wanted to check like the the little chat and invite everybody that has any questions for our speakers to share here um any comments that you have on this conversation i'm like super inspired and um yeah i i wanted to ask you since we are like in the q a <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I had this um, view, a, a similar view of feeling like where I was my birthplace, um, feeling like quite at home and going to somewhere else, like for 
example, I'm currently living in Mexico and I do feel mm -hmm. here more at home than I ever felt in Puerto Rico, although there was my family. And there's this whole like identity politics saying that, you know, like you should always you know, go back to your country or, or you know, not be a, a, um, a treasoner, a, a, a commit treason to your birthplace. And I do not feel like that. I, I do honor my birthplace, but I have a connection to another land. And um, I don't know what's your view on that. Um, I mean, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Yeah, I feel um, it's interesting how far you back you want to go in history because many of us were always moving, actually. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, in the Philippines, you have a mixture of races, like people coming also from different roots and different uh, lineages and so on. And um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of clues and keys for us in our country of origin. Um, and then also, we are, yeah, part of this global community and we also have, um, yeah, so many of us are misplaced at this time. I don't know if we can just stay um, in that one place because it, it could, it doesn't even mean one thing anymore necessarily like where are you from or um but yeah i'd love to hear from catherine like catherine were you born in the u.s i was born here in california first generation born here in california um i think um there's there's a spirit that's asking us to find home wherever we are i think really i think there's um this feeling of like not feeling home in, cer in a certain way, but then there's also, when we dive deeper into it, it's just this even, just this deeper connection of, it's okay to not, we can feel home in many places. Um, and we, it's okay to, um, yeah, to, to discover other areas because other areas can reflect different parts of ourselves to us. Um, sorry, Monica. Were you say, Monica, were you saying something or? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I said, I, I tried to speak because I was like, yeah, it immediately made me think of, um, it, it could just be like being more deeply connected to the environment that we're in, um, which we might have forgotten because we haven't really been taught how to connect deeply to our environment, which indigenous people typically have because their whole language and everything is centered around place, like the land, like the mountains, the rivers, the ocean, like everything is part of your, your sense of being in a place, which I think we can relearn wherever we are planted and rooted and, um, and also having community. So many people feel lonely today, mm -hmm. um, even though we can connect online and feel connected to the, you know, more people than ever before. Um, it's not the same as having real community. And I think we're also trying to learn how to come back to real community. And like you say, Catherine, with that interconnected sense of like, where is everything from? Even that, like I always try and check that, like one of the most profound things about living here is that often we'll have a meal and, um, and I know where every ingredient is from, from every friend, from every piece of land. It's like, wow, I never grew up with that because I grew up buying everything from a supermarket, plastic wrapped and out of season because we'd be able to access things all year round. And so um, one of the most healing things for me being here is really that um, feeling of, oh, I'm so connected to where my food is from or the people who, are in this community um, and that's still improving and growing all the time I, I think but um, I think that's a huge part of wherever we end up is trying to get back to that sense of place. Um, we have a here a question by Norka. Norka would you like to share it with us like speak to our speakers? I'm gonna unmute you yeah. 
it's just not that good. I'm from Panama City. Um, here in Panama, we have a lot of indigenous people living at the city, but, but at the same time, they have their own land. Um, they live apart. So I just wanted to know how is this situation affecting the group of in, indigenous people in your country? Because here, um, just because they are apart, um, they have trouble with the food. Usually they go and fish, but now they cannot go uh, out to the sea to fish. Um, I work in, in a museum uh, of human rights and we're trying to um, collect food for them. But the thing is that they don't eat what we usually eat, you know, like it's spaghetti or canned food. Um, so this is affecting them on different levels. I just want to know how it's affecting the group of indigenous people where you live. Um, thank you, Narka. <laughs> thank you, Narka. I mean, I think that's a similar um, experience that, uh, that, I mean, I can't, I'm not directly um, connected to a specific community, so I can't speak too much in detail about it, but I can imagine that exactly what you're saying, that can be um, the reality for many, many communities that are, that are, it's the same reality that many communities are facing um, in, in other parts. Our specific, and I know in um, the New Mexico territory, um, there's it's just that they're not getting the government assistance they're not getting government assistance um, at the speed that they need it versus other people that are receiving it. Um, but as far as food, I know that there are people um, bringing food in. I'm not sure if they are accepting the food or what their relationship to, is, to that is, but um, Hannah, can you speak to what's happening in, in your community? Yeah, I think, um so far in Costa Rica, we've been relatively um, fortunate to have not been impacted that much so far. They, you know, created lockdown pretty early on um, before even there were many cases in the country. And there was um, really just one reported case in our region and she got better. And um, so it hasn't become so much of a, um, a threat directly here. And I am... Um, and there's enough, and uh, one of the things as well is that uh, really the indigenous groups have been ignored for so long in Costa Rica anyway. They've learned to be pretty um, um, self-sufficient. I mean, it's not always so simple, but the jungle um, at least is pretty abundant where we live. There's always access to food, you know, you um, and the indigenous people that uh, I know, um, the Bri Bri local people here, like, their knowledge of what they can eat and what um, they have access to just within the jungle is so incredible. And I think like across a whole entire lifetime, I'll only scratch the surface of that um, myself. But I think on the whole here, we've been so fortunate because they really have um, just their own knowledge and, and way of um, gathering food and it hasn't, um, I mean, it definitely is affecting different communities and there are definitely um, communities that have become more dependent on our way, and which of course is now failing. Uh, I mean, these modern food supplies and so on. And this is also an issue where we've created dependencies um, and suddenly a pandemic hits the world. We focus more on ourselves um, within our own countries and perhaps um this you know these these ways that we've been supporting or helping is is then limited and suddenly people are um yeah a, a little bit left stranded and not supported also by their mm -hmm. government or um even by the i guess some of the organizations that were helping um communities so there are um definitely issues and i think this is a huge part of why i care um, 
about us all, um, but especially indigenous people who, um, you know, a lot of the elders we speak to are concerned about the young who so much want to live like us. And it's so um, short-sighted in many ways because I think we've been selling a lie um, about our beautiful modern system um, because it doesn't serve everyone. You know, it serves very few really. Um, and, and the images that were fed by media, and I think actually television has a huge impact on the sense of, oh, I want that easy life, or I want that way, which is, again, not the promise. Like, it's, it's, I mean, there's a big, big thing here where a lot of young, free breed people were um, kind of sold this dream of going to university, so going to the city and becoming educated. Um, and what would happen, what has been happening, which is a huge problem, is um, many would get to the city and go to university. They would first of all be treated really badly, like, um, you know, very racist uh, and like, looked down upon for just, I guess, the way they dress or the way um, their lack of resources and so on. And then there are no jobs within the system that they can get. So suddenly they come back. They feel disconnected from their, their lineage and their people and their land. Um, and they feel depressed. And the suicide rate has actually been huge for young um, people in this area. So part of our work with elders has been like, how can we, um, uh, again, we're not here to save, we're just here to like learn from one another and, and be in the conversation of like, how can we also find our, our pride again in our heritage and our roots, and especially with indigenous people, to feel so proud of the, like their knowledge and their wisdom, and like like we were saying immediately, like I'm grateful for the indigenous friends I have here, and I wish to have more because if supply chains cut off from here, and you know we don't have access to uh, Western medical healthcare and, and and so on, like they have a remedy for nearly everything within the jungle. Mm -hmm. And they have, um, again, sources of food, um, ways to access springs in the jungle and um, get clean water. And, you know, we capture rain, which is like uh, a beautiful source for us just to always have water because it rains so much. But um, there's something about coming back to that and uh, not constantly selling this, this story that becoming modernized is the way um, and working together as communities I think I really hope to do more work here um, but the indigenous here as well it's beautiful a lot of the tribes across Costa Rica came together um, for this day of spiritual work and they see it as really important to one they don't want you to name the virus because they feel like it's a spirit that will come to you if you name it and they really believed in switching off the media, which I think many of us have learned is like, you can become um, swallowed up by it and it in it itself is its own pandemic of fear um, and anxiety of like constantly like this happening, this happening, this happening. And when you come back to that deeper connection to, to land and to, um, yeah, important, it also helps you be prepared and be resilient and so on. So I was very inspired by that, um, that practice and that way and, and, connect, and reminding myself to constantly do that also to take days away from technology and come back to a deeper connection. But yeah, I started to go off on some tangents, but I don't know if there's any other questions or anything else shared. Um, Ella, Monica, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions. It was very uh, interesting and this inspiring listening to you and to your experiences. And I'm very happy that I was part of this. I hope that we see you do this more often. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you all for being here with us. <laughs> Well, I think this is a very good way to finish off this Women Being Talk number two, Indigenous Respect. I want to uh, leave a final question for our speakers. Where can we find more about your work and how can we follow you? 
So currently, um, what I have available right now is uh, Weaver of Light, but Baha'i Dali Sai will be launching in fall dash winter. So definitely stay tuned into that. Um, yes. Uh, and you have to um, follow Catherine because she creates the most beautiful artwork and um, inspired. It's been one of the most inspiring accounts on Instagram for that I've been um, able to, to, to um, yeah, witnessing and um, yeah, grateful to that. And you can find about um, my work with, um, I work with sort of, I, use, I began my work sort of with deep feminine history, like looking at deep past, um, the archaeological record and, and the stories that we just weren't really shared in school and media. And then that began integrating more and more with indigenous um, uh, female perspectives uh, around four or five years ago. So you can find that soulseedgathering.com. Uh, that's a um, place of research, um, media, and uh, we're also launching um, some beautiful things in the, in the upcoming year. We can share more perspectives and voices from um, different cultures and different ways of seeing. I really wish for us to be a media house that can um, provide more inspiration and sources of action and point to projects like Catherine's and to just, um, I think we, we need to just know more about what the beautiful things going on because there is so much and also where we can lend our hand when um, we are able to. But uh, yeah, you can find me also on Instagram. I'm, my personal page is Hannah Ruth Dyson. Um, yeah, those are the, kind of the main places, yeah. Well, thank you so much in the name of thank Women you. Being Magazine. I invite you all to follow also womenbeing.co.uk slash talks for the upcoming talks that we will be having next week. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Have a great thank day. You. Bye, everybody.